foodie. 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 From the, wait, no, I'm not even going to start with from the Not A Foodie studio because are we even in the studio anymore? We, we haven't had a studio. <laughs> we had a real studio. <laughs> And then we left the studio, and then COVID happened anyway. Yes, so anyway. So we really... <laughs> it's the Not A Foodie Show. <laughs> um, I'm Tommy Alley, uh, and with me is Mike Moranti, a.k.a. Mikey Pomodoro. Mikey, introduce yourself. Hey, guys. How's it going? I'm Mike Moranti. Uh, I'm the owner, operator, chicken parm connoisseur of Mikey Pomodoro. Uh, lifelong restaurant guy who, after dur- mid COVID during COVID, was like, you know what? All the restaurants are dying. Let me uh, let me try to open one, and uh, here we are. <laughs> Mike, every restaurant during the pandemic decided to close and start a podcast, and we decided to take a pause on our podcast so that you could open up a restaurant during the pandemic. And so, like, I I mean, most of those podcasts no longer exist. <laughs> And most of those restaurants also still don't exist. So, so good on so, us. Like, we're, we're, we're two up. for two. Yeah, yeah. We're two for two. So anyway, we we have a lot of new listeners from what I understand. We are the Not A Foodie Show. We're just going to talk about food and food culture. We've got some great guests. We've got an amazing guest on this show. We've got Casey Korn, who is on the Magnolia Network. You'll hear from her a little bit later. We're going to talk about her show. We're going to talk about how we met. Let's get into... Just what's on your mind, Mike? You have anything uh, on your mind? Uh, I just I want to talk about Pete Wells, his top one hundred restaurants of New York City. Yeah, I think Pete Wells has a way better idea of what's going on in New York than Michelin does. Oh man! So let's let's set this uh, up. Like, let's back up for a second. So Pete Wells to yeah. Pete Wells just this past weekend I guess it was maybe a week ago two weeks ago put out his best one his top 100 restaurants in New York City 2023 and Pete Wells is the restaurant critic restaurant critic for the New York Times and for a long time the New York Times only reviewed you know really fancy places and and everything like that and then over the past you know probably probably starting with bruni they decided to start going for more the outer they didn't go to the outer no they didn't do a lot of outer borough stuff but they went with like more mid-range restaurants and street carts and you know things like that where they would write about them but not necessarily review them so what's awesome about this list to you mikey that it hit every price point every borough uh, nobody was underrepresented. I've met so many food critics, quote unquote, who like won't go to Queens, you know, what still in like 2023 won't go to Jackson Heights for dumplings. Won't, won't go to Flushing. Won't. I, I like that Pete. Well, and Pete Wells also, uh, Mikey Pomodoro uh, fan. <laughs> That's right. He's come by. I'm on his Instagram. Nice. <laughs> Gave me a huge shout out. So Pete gets, like, really gets it. <laughs> yes, he gets it because he gets Mikey Pomodoro. Do you think we could get Pete Wells oh, I don't on? No, probably not. I don't think it would be a conflict of interest. He's never going to, like, review a Mikey Pomodoro. <laughs> we are so below the radar that it would not be a conflict of interest. Um, well, I, I am. I'm like super stoked that our friends from the Queens Night Market cracked the top ten, number nine. John Wang, who is wild, he's so been on the awesome. podcast before. He's going to come on this season too. We've talked to him. He's gonna. We're going to have John on, the founder of the Queens Night Market. But Queens Night Market, number nine best restaurant in New York. Not technically a restaurant, but who's splitting hairs here? Like I, I'm so psyched for that. I was psyched that. There are the restaurants like Via Carota and Atomics and Tatiana is is number one. La Bernadette is still on there. Gramercy Tavern is still on there. But like I'm also really excited about the restaurants like that are in the South Bronx and in Queens and in Brooklyn, but not just Williamsburg, Brooklyn. You know, it, it's just such a great list and. It is. Is this the first time they've done that? I think so. I think so. I mean, I 
because we've never talked about it before. And I feel like if it happened in the last five years, we would have covered yeah, it. Yeah, I, I don't know that they've ever gone this like this broad with their definition of what a restaurant is. Uh, and I I love it. I mean, this is this is the great representation of New York City dining, right? You've got La Bernardin, and then you know you've got Birialandia in Jackson Heights for Mexican food. Like it's just, it's amazing. It's a, it's just a great way to celebrate the food world in New York, and it is not stuffy. It is down to earth. It's approachable. Every all of these places, you know, not all of these places, obviously, but like a lot of these places, you could just walk in and get a taco, which is pretty amazing. So good on you, Pete Wells. Good on you, New York Times. Uh, shout out Pete Wells for putting New York, doing New York right, treating the outer boroughs with the respect they deserve, and uh, highlighting young chefs and putting them over some of the biggest chefs in the world. You you know who doesn't complicate cooking though? I know where this is going. What a segue. Go ahead. Food anthropologist, <laughs> general badass. Host of uh, Magnolia Networks. Recipe Lost and Found with our friend Casey Korn. Casey was good enough to stop by the show. And by stop by the show, I mean that we did a remote call with her and recorded it. And let's play that interview. Hey, Casey. How you doing? Hey, guys. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, so, it's been it's been so cool to like keep track of everything that you've been doing. Mike, why don't you um tell everyone how we met Casey? Do you do you remember? <laughs> yeah. No, I I absolutely remember. Um we met Casey at the 2019 Fancy Food Show what that we get press passes to. Wow. <laughs> uh we get at <laughs> At the Jack that we Center, talked our way into getting press at the, tr- <laughs> at, at the truff uh, station. Uh, the truffleist. Um, yes. Tr- the truffleist, not truff. The truffle. Got to keep my truffle brands um, on point, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. No. So I'm, I'm 85 percent close. Screwing up the brand is of yeah. But uh, and but what I really do remember more than the brand, more importantly, is you said, and you're the only person I've ever met to uh give them to have this title uh is a food anthropologist yep (laughs) and that stuck with me forever i mean we've been Uh, friends since then then (laughs) yeah and now to see what you're doing um it is food anthropology it's the coolest thing yeah so what i mean i think so i'm glad you do (laughs) well casey i so i I love, I I geek out over food anthropology stuff. I love, I read books on food anthropology, on on just the origins of things. And I geek out with my own family's cultural, like food anthropology, when my mother will say that, you know, she remembers something that her great grandfather used to have around the table. um, And she doesn't know the name of it. And it's something that I have to go hunting down in old Italian markets to find. (laughs) <laughs> like that's that's one of my favorite things ever. So just tell everybody about what food anthropology is and really more importantly how you've translated that to a show that's on Magnolia Network cuz I think that's fascinating. Yeah, so um I am not only a food anthropologist, I'm also a classically trained chef. Um but really what I strive to do with my life is connect people through food. I mean The old saying, you are what you eat, is really true because not only do the food choices you make as a person define who you are, you can also look at communities of people. As you're saying, you know, looking at your family's and your culture's food and geeking out over that, that's something that ties you to a group of people. And I find that people and food are so intricately connected that ways that we can overcome our differences, find common ground, the best way to do that is through food. So it's something I've been passionate about for a really long time. I've been very fortunate to be able to translate this to a job that's not in academics, um, which I think very (laughs) few people have managed to do. Um, And yeah, I actually, so my show, um, Recipe Lost and Found, um, the premise is that I help 
people recreate their lost family recipes. Like you said, you know, going to the market and trying to track down these old ingredients or, you know, not somebody not knowing what an ingredient is, you know, you are capable as a food person to go out and do that research and find it. But most people aren't, they don't have that knowledge and they weren't as connected as they thought they were to these recipes. So, um, on my show, I go through with families um, everything they can remember and you know what this recipe was doing when and where the people were, every little teeny detail to sort of put the puzzle together to recreate this lost recipe. Um, and the way this all came about, shockingly enough, was through Instagram. Um, <laughs> oh. Yeah, I know. I... Like, you know, people say, you know, use social media. It'll be really helpful. And somehow it actually was. <laughs> um, I had made some post uh, also in 2019 uh, with the hashtag food anthropology. And a producer saw it and reached out to me and was like, hey, um, do you have any interest in being on TV? I swear this isn't a scam. Do you want to like have a call? And I was like, sure, that sounds great. I actually had been pitching a different show, um, unfortunately with not much success. And we got on a call. She is great. She's been my executive producer now since 2019. We've been working on this project. Um, and we filmed a little sizzle reel in LA in November, 2019. And then, of course, the whole world shut down. So, <laughs> so, so I was in, I was in LA January twenty twenty. Oh. Yeah, it's just like the, just had a totally normal like long weekend. Yeah, I was with, with you. I was with you. Actually, it was for the it was for the fancy food show. We went to the in fancy San Francisco food show and, and we went to LA. LA. So we were just like s- spitting droplets on each other, <laughs> yeah, with, you know, with a million strangers. <laughs> like went went down to LA on Venice did, did the whole thing and then the world just oh my god and all that so, and everything changes but so my covid i'm going to i'm going to give you experience i'm going to give you my quick very quick covid like beginning of a horror movie story is i was on the oh plane god. back <laughs> on the plane back from a um, fancy food show i was i don't i think i was flying out of oakland maybe i was flying out of LAX, i'm not sure but i remember walking to the airport it's like one of those 6 a.m. flights and the TSA oh. is giving a briefing that I'm overhearing about if anyone's coughing, like put them to the side. Everyone has to wear their masks and everything. <sighs> like this. And this is in you know January 2020. And I'm like, oh, oh my, my God. <laughs> like this is how the beginning of a zombie movie starts. Like there's always that Seriously? opening credit scene where like the, the government is giving a, a thing. So yes, that is my fond it's memory. It's literally the of beginning of The Last of Us. Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh man! Goodness. So anyway, I, we yeah. were all at that show, um, and you know we're still yeah, here. Right? We survived the zombie apocalypse thus far. So thank goodness, it's a good thing. Yes, yeah, so thus far is true. <laughs> but I do have to say that, like, so I've been following along with everything that you've done, but I haven't watched the show until <gasps> until we started talking about you coming on <laughs> for the podcast, and now last I'm week. like, yeah, last week. Now I'm obsessed. Now I'm like this is this is a show oh. that like checks all the boxes for me. It's like it's perfect. It's food. Oh. It's geeky like historical stuff. It's like tracking down, you know, mystery ingredients and trying to decipher things. Like there was one there, there was one episode where we were rebuilding um a lasagna and I'm in my back of you know like I'm, yes. I have it on in the background and I'm like that's a bechamel she's talking about. And then you're like you're obviously talking about a bechamel and I'm like oh, the show is awesome. I love this. Casey, we're on the same wavelength. So I love the show. Oh, I love that. It's, it's so great. Thank you. <laughs> and it's cute. You know, I mean, I like to joke that I'm I'm a little bit more ag- aggressive than Magnolia in real life a little bit sometimes. I, I swear a lot, which is not Magnolia. Um, but it really is, I think, the love of food and the love of culture that comes through, it's really endearing. And the people are great. It's such a fun show to work on. I've had the most amazing crews through the whole 10 episodes that we filmed. Um, It's really been such a joy to do. And the fact that I get to give back to these people, I mean, you watched the lasagna episode. Like, I don't really want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't watched it, but like, spoiler alert, we usually find the recipe. But that <laughs> that episode in particular was one of my favorites. The woman, Carolyn, was wonderful and just all she wanted was this lasagna. And I love lasagna so much, so it was great. 
<laughs> to get to do this. And when the episode actually was pitched to me, because the way that it works is I have an amazing team. Um, they both take submissions from people and go out and manage to somehow find these brilliant stories around America. And they come to me and they go, okay, we've got like 10 different possibilities. Are there any recipes that really interest you? And when they pitched me the lasagna, the first thing they said was like these layers of paper thin lasagna. And I was like, yes, let's do that. Because I had been to Italy um, 2013, I think. Had uh, My brother was studying abroad there. We'd gone to Florence. We'd had a great time. My family rented this house in Tuscany. And the like nona of the house made us this dinner upon our arrival. And it was like this pesto lasagna with, it felt like a hundred layers of this paper thin pasta with just pesto in between. I rem- I can still taste this dish. And they said paper thin lasagna. And I was like, yes, I'm like back in this old Tuscan house. I want to do this recipe. <laughs> and it was, I think it's the most successful recipe also that I've done. It, I think it was spot on exactly what her great grandmother was making. I love it. I love it, Mikey. I don't know if you've watched the wow. show, but it is it it's fantastic. I know that you're a, you're a cord cutter and you you don't have a lot of TV access, but I'm gonna it's I'm gonna only share my minutes. password. Get your free yeah exactly. Get a free week of Discovery no, Plus and binge it. It's only twenty minutes. <laughs> oh, I think we have Discovery. There Plus. you go. There you um, go. <laughs> uh, well, so I think the the core of the show is just so relatable to everybody because everybody has a recipe that is a family recipe. Yes. Um, at at my restaurant, uh, my meatballs they're called Artie's meatballs for my dad, right? Like the, it's like my my take on my dad's meatballs. But no, check this out. My second cousin Annette from California <laughs> messages me on Facebook and goes. What's your dad's meatball recipe? I'm like, okay, so this is what I do, and like, this is what his is, and here are the differences. And she goes like, and like, I use panko breadcrumbs, right? Like little little things like that. And she goes, yeah, I don't know what any of those things you said were, but that is your great grandmother's recipe. (laughs) What? And like my my forget about my great grandmother, right? Like my grandparents had passed away before I was born. So like to this this woman who had no idea that I was ever going to exist, the oh. food that she made to like f- just keep her kids like alive, is now like so integral to me and who I am. It's who you are. And, like the chick, the the chicken parm is like like the main mm-hmm. draw item, but like when when people compliment my meatballs, it means so much more to me. Oh. Well, I love that. I think yeah. that one of the yeah, things it's, it's one of the important. things that you said on the show on on the lasagna, not to harp back to the lasagna episode, but you, you talked about oh, talk about the lasagna <laughs> as much as you want. You, you you said something about how you know things can things can change, recipes can change. Um, you were talking to uh, I think a bunch of you know Italian grandmothers, expats that you know, yes, and and. And, you know, they've adapted their recipes for American. You know, they don't eat red meat, so yes. there's ground turkey and, you know, things like that. Um, very not tradi- non-traditional, but, like, recipes can adapt. And that that hit home with me. I mean, we're when, when we're recording this, it's a, you know, it's a couple days before Easter. And in the Italian side of mm-hmm. the family, we make something called uh, pizza gena or pizza rustica. It's a... Um, and it's a it's a heavy sort of almost like a pie that is just you know stuffed with meats and cheeses and things like that. And it's supposed to be like you eat that you know after you Lent and it's after you're not you haven't been eating <laughs> meat or whatever. We just eat it as a snack because it's delicious. Right. But my story and my long winded story is getting to a point. Um, we we have recipe books that from my mother's side of the family, from my father's side of the family, from my father's in-law side of the family like there's just different recipes for all of this um and we've combined them all and my wife who is not italian at all um just came up with a better version of the dough and so now like we make our own version of this whole thing she's a baker, she is a baker. Yeah, yeah you you're you got to sell it on that. You, have, you, you said you said my wife was not Italian. My wife has, was has also a baker. With these, yeah. She's not a professional the, baker, but she is a baker. Incredible <laughs> homemade cakes. That She's I've not had, Italian, so I, dismissed. Yes. <laughs> What? Wait up. Well, but now we've got this, you know, we've got this pizza rustica that we make every year that is from all different sides of the family and from 
you know, the Irish Norwegian baker who I married. I love and it. And like now it's our, this is our recipe. And it's this, you know, it's such a traditional thing that we made our own, which I think is so important in, uh, like I am, I am not a person who is, uh, look, this is the way that it always has been. So this is the way that it has right. to be. You know, and that's that's I think one of the messages that you get out in your show, you know, when you, there's there's importance of where we all came from through food, but there's also this importance yes. of where we're going with it, you know, and combining things. Totally. And, you know, it's so interesting because, you know, right now as we're talking, I feel like in food media, there's been the past week, week and a half has been this whole story about well, do these Italian dishes like carbonara, like pizza, are they actually Italian or did they come from America? And it's been an interesting thing to follow because so much of what we eat in America as Italian food, I mean, Mikey, you can speak to this probably more than anyone, yeah. is a very specific category of what Italian food is. Italian American food is its own thing. Uh, so much so. Um... So before COVID, I was working at an Italian, Italian restaurant. Like the, the partners were from Rome. Uh, they have a spot in Brooklyn. This one was in Manhattan. And people, they wouldn't, you know, like the the typical bridge and tunnel diner. Yes. Okay? <laughs> they, they wouldn't open the menu. And they'd just be like, oh, I'll just take the chicken parm. And we'd be like, we don't sell that here. <laughs> And they'd be like, aren't you an Italian restaurant? And we're like, we are an Italian restaurant. Yes, exactly. Restaurant. <laughs> yeah. And it, it there's a lot of like snotty. And that like, I that was me being snotty because this chick doesn't even have the effort to like open the menu. <laughs> but like, there's a lot of like snotty Italians who are like chicken parm, this and that. And like the totally Don Angie's does it the best where they're they're doing Italian American dishes to the right 10, 10 you know, tippy top degree. Um, but yeah, I Italian American food is beautiful. Italian food is beautiful. The, the I, I don't know if you've ever watched uh, the food that built America, no. the history channel show. I gotta watch it. Okay. Adam Richman, um, mm -hmm, is mm -hmm. like the head for it. And all, you know, Domino's and pizza hut were from the Midwest. Right. And the, it's the Midwestern palate meets Italian Absolutely. Food. And I think it's sad that, well, I think it's interesting and I love that people are interested in where their food comes from and how it's developed. But I think back to like one of my most, I don't, I, I, not traumatic is not the right word, but like frustrating moments of culinary school is I went to culinary school in London. I went to Le Cordon Bleu London. Um, and one of my chefs who was French who I'm, I'm still good friends with, fortunately. Um, I wanted to do this like ratatouille, but it was like, I, I was, it was spring. It wasn't even fall. I don't know why I feel like I'm telling this memory as if it was autumn. It was not, it was spring. <laughs> but I wanted to do this ratatouille that had like pumpkin and maple, like a sort of like California, New York t twist on what ratatouille could be. And he looks at me and he goes, Casey, this is not ratatouille. Like, very aggressive. Like, the appellation is very Offended. important. Like, what you call it is important. And people, I, I don't disagree. What you call food is important. But what food can be is so many things. And if we get too stuck into what is this food? And I think, like, you know, you guys being not a foodie, like, is such a great point because... There are a lot of foodies, people who call themselves foodies, which I also am not a huge fan of the term, um, which is, I think, th the original thing we bonded over <laughs> in 2019, um, is that they get very snobby about what is food and, well, what is this dish? And if you're not putting in the right breadcrumbs, then they're not meatballs. And it's like, no, they're my meatballs. And that's okay. not only okay, that's what makes food magical. Yes. Right? Yes. I agree with 99% <laughs> of that. Except? Keep your fucking heavy cream and peas out of my carbonara. <laughs> okay, I love that you brought up carbonara because that's also one of my few because things. that's the most bastardized. So I, when I make, I run an Italian-American restaurant, I will never make Italian-American carbonara. <laughs> I love that because... Uh, like... <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my god. I love this because so one of me and my husband's absolute favorite quotes of all time that just happens to be related to food is which is also carbonara related is there's like a daytime talk show in England. My husband's from England, which is partially why I went to culinary school in London. And they're, they're on, there's this daytime talk show, the host, they're doing this cooking segment with this chef Gino De Campo, and he's an Italian chef, but he's based in England and he's making this pasta. And I honestly, I don't even remember what the pasta dish is. I've just watched the clip of him saying this 800 million times. And one of the hosts looks at him and goes like, oh, well, if you added ham, it would like be like a carbonara. And he looks at her with horror on his face and goes, yes, and if my grandma had wheels, she'd be a bike. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> It is one of the all-time best food comments <laughs> because it's tr there are some things that if you do change an ingredient, it really isn't. You, you've taken both the technique, the ingredients, like the essence of the dish away. I think if you add maple and pumpkin to a dish that uses mostly ratatouille ingredients and cook it like ratatouille, you call it pumpkin maple ratatouille, ratatouille. like fine, yes. whatever, yeah. right? But if you add peas and cream to carbonara, you're losing the technique of how to make carbonara with eggs, and you're adding ingredients that aren't there. Like, it's creamy pea eggy it. pasta. Well, well, it needs its own name. It's still delicious. It's just who, not carbonara. It's not carbonara. No, absolutely 100%. That, I mean, that's fair. I'll also never sell fettuccine Alfredo. Oh, I love fettuccine that, Alfredo. Just, I'm sorry. While, while we're just talking about things that I'm hating on. I, I have no problem oh, with I do fettuccine love, that's Alfredo. That's actually one of the first. I can't call it Italian. Oh. I have no problem with it, but I can't call it Italian. It's an American no, dish. No, that's, that's fine. We, 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 we work with an Indian uh, chef to do his Italian part of like 500 person weddings. And we'll do it then because we don't use the Mikey Pomodoro name. We just well, there just you go. <laughs> well, I mean, Mikey, I think you I know this. It. I think I told you this, but like the dirty little secret to all of my like spicy fra diablo or spicy pastas is I use gochugang or gochugaru. I use like Korean. Mm. And it just it gives it such a better flavor than just you know crushed red pepper. And if I'm not gonna like dry my own Calabrian chilies, I'm using I'm using right. fermented <laughs> chili paste. You know, a Korean fermented chili paste. In my Fra Diablo. Uh, I have to give you um, my red pepper flakes or Calabrians. Uh, next time oh, you know, I grow them. Some. I Just grow them. Side note. When, Just, when I was in my 20s, yeah. I used to buy. No a, big deal. I, when I was in my 20s, I would buy illicit substances in little bags. Now I buy seeds that are illicit substances in, in little bags that come from, you know, that are smuggled into this country. Same yeah, same size, size bags. bags. It's I just, love it. They're filled with seeds instead right? of other things. <laughs> Different contraband. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hilarious. Wow. So, so what are some of the things like what, what I'm assuming that you have to do so much research. Um, like when you when you go into the show, it looks very breezy, very like, oh, this is this and this is right. that. And like, it's great. But obviously, as someone who's, you know, been behind the scenes of, of shows before, I know there's a lot of research. What are some like really interesting things that you've learned that you were just basically like, oh, my God, that's so cool about you know, food, about anything, about, like, food culture. So my show is only 22 minutes long, 22, 24 minutes. Um, I do hours and hours and hours of research myself. And then also on top of that, my production team does hours and hours and hours of research. So there's a lot that doesn't make it into the show. Um, one of my most favorite things is we did a sort of Thanksgiving episode uh, where I helped recreate a family's cranberry sauce that's next in I my queue by the way, way. Too deep. that episode is next in my queue just so you know <laughs> oh okay it's it's a cute one um i did way too much research on cranberries and the history of cranberries <laughs> trying to sort of track down because a lot doesn't make it into the show you know the the mom was uh, born in the Midwest, moved to Hawaii, but the recipe was first made in LA. Like it, it just was sort of all over. And it's, even if the research is not actually helpful, it's, it's nice to get the context. So I'd done all this research into cranberries and discovered that I think it was in, oh God, the forties or fifties. Um, the fifties actually, I believe was the great, great, great cranberry scare, um, when some food, 
uh, it wasn't like the FDA then, but whatever the Food Commission was in the United States found like a teeny trace of some carcinogen in a batch of cranberries. And like, it was right before Thanksgiving, they did a whole statement and like the whole country was like, we're not buying cranberries. It like almost completely destroyed every cranberry farmer in America. It was like a massive scandal. Um, the White House did applesauce instead of cranberries at uh, the Thanksgiving White House dinner. And some like doo-wop band wrote a song about the great cranberry scare that you can find on YouTube. Actually, it's hilarious. It's a total bop, like, oh my God. you know, for the 1950s. It's hilarious. And it's it's these kinds of things that you realize that they transcend just one part of, like, popular culture. Because food is a part of popular culture, for sure. It it What happens with our food makes it across so many different arenas of our lives. I mean to have like a song recorded about this thing that we nobody's ever even heard about. Right? And there's like this evidence of how much it affected people enough that someone decided to write a song about it. Hilarious. It it blows my mind. Oh my god, that's crazy. That's crazy. I'm uh, now I'm uh now I'm going to go look up that song and put that on my uh my cooking mix. Yeah. It's funny. <laughs> I, I love I mean I I love the all outro. of those obscure facts I love like I you know any of the um, gastro obscura type stuff and you know oh, all yeah. of that stuff is is crazy I'm also are you a reader or like I'm I'm a big reader oh, of yes. food culture like of food food totally. anthropology anthropology yes um, like food like just food history I mean I literally like have sitting next to me what are you the reading? Oxford Companion to food nice. Oh, wow. I, I mean, it's it. just always on like my desk because it's my number one resource for everything. Also, my library is aggressively food anthropology. You know what I'm reading now? Um, it's ridiculous. Another from another Atlantean and another food anthropologist. I'm yes. reading um, Our Fermented Lives by yes julia skinner julia skinner dr julia skinner yeah she's she's awesome. she's great yeah she's awesome. i i just interviewed her for a story actually for epicurious oh, so wow. and we oh, we've no like known each other peripherally for years and we've never actually met in person we've tried a few times we've almost run into each other at the farmer's market but we've never actually managed to meet up I love yeah she's it. great i love it and i'm i'm also like i went down the, the fermentation rabbit hole a few years ago um, you know, during COVID, oh, yeah. I, during COVID, I, I mm-hmm. perfected it. I think um, I just Ooh. like making hot sauces. Big and, words. Yes. No. I know. Right. No. You can, as much as one can <laughs> perfect fermentation. Right. There's always something else to learn. <laughs> yes. I had. A, I had. I was fermenting everything. I had a distillery in my little like. There's a little greenhouse on this property that like, and I made it into a okay. distillery. Like I was making weird moonshine, distilling all this crazy stuff. Mike bought oh, me the uh, the Noma uh, distill uh, fermentation book and like you know yes. all of that stuff. I also interviewed Dave Zilber for this story, too. Oh, wow. That I just did. Is it, it was just a fermentation yeah. story, I guess, right? <laughs> um, it was on whether or not mustard goes bad. Oh, wow. Which should be coming out in Epicurious soon, I'm imagining. Well, I have but, a yeah. I have a two year old batch of fermented mustard down in my fridge down here. It's a little made with an English stout. Well, the answer mm-hmm. is it does not go bad because mustard is antibacterial. Love it. So Love there you it. go. <laughs> Oh, that's great! That's I, I'm what I gonna learned. have to. I, first of all, I think we're gonna we're gonna need to start a not a foodie book club, um, and you're gonna be one of the charter <laughs> yes. members. And you know, second Done. of all, I'm, if I'm if that does not happen, I'm DMing you because I need just a reading list um, of you know. Just oh, whatever I got you. you. Cool, good, good. I love it. <laughs> um, <sighs> Well, I think like this is we've been. I could talk forever about fermentation I know. and books and food anthropology and you know, and the the French uh, way that they you know put their noses up at anyone who tries to <laughs> make anything on ratatouille. But I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, Casey, do you have do you have anything you want to plug? First of all, like the show. Let's let's talk about the show. Plug yeah. The show. Um, um- watch recipe lost and found uh it's on magnolia network you can watch it on discovery plus um there's two seasons 10 episodes it's cute it's great you'll enjoy binging it um are, also check out my website 22 minutes yeah it's short 20, are all the episodes out Meant now or binge. are they being released they are yeah oh, okay. so all episodes are out waiting to hear about the next season so keep your fingers crossed 
Um, and then, yeah, check out my website, uh, IamTheCornivore.com, since I love a food pun. <laughs> and you can also get the recipes from the show on my website. Nice. So, and what's your Insta? An because extra reason to go. We've talked about Instagram a lot. What's your What's your Insta? Yeah. Uh, my Insta is Casey underscore corn. All right. Nice and easy. Just my name. Very cool. Well, Casey, uh, thanks for thanks for everything. Thanks for agreeing to be on the show. Thanks, guys. I am so excited you, to, uh, to to continue it was this so conversation. Easy to book you. <laughs> <laughs> you got lucky. I'll say it's that. Same yeah. DM. <laughs> hey, we're bringing the pod back. You I want love to it. You for you guys, of course. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Casey. Mike Casey was awesome. Thank you for reaching out to her and, and getting her on the show. If you know anybody else who wants to be on the show, send them our way. And we want to talk no, to everybody. No, not, not everybody. We're back podcasting. Interesting send people. Send people our no. way. Yes, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to everybody. And then we'll decide who's interesting and we put <laughs> on the pod. That's the way you do it. <laughs> All right, Mike. So we used to end the show asking what – everyone's what you were drinking tonight that was the question what are you drinking tonight we ran out of cocktails we to switch we've that listed up. every single we cocktail in cocktails. the history of cocktails all right but i think we need to switch it up i think what we're gonna what i'm gonna ask you is what's your perfect bite what since we last recorded what is the most delicious thing that you ate and it could be a cocktail mm-hmm. it could be a bag of chips it could be uh something that you cooked for yourself something that you ate at a restaurant so what was it the single best thing about owning the restaurant now is how much stuff i can order like for the house but like for for a professional restaurant but we eat at the house so i got a two and a half pound hanger steak and just what a perfect perfect piece of meat what a perfect cut it's so tender, it's so rich, it, it it's it's so cheap, uh, it's just the the perfect like meat. I, I I get why butchers used to save it for themselves. Yeah, it was called the butcher's cut for a long time. It's it's great. I love hanger steak. So yeah, what did you do with just it? Just reverse seared it. That's it. We just cooked it and then uh, nice. We did like some sauteed vegetables and that was, it was just really, really, oh, and a chimichurri. Sorry. It was just really delicious. But like, nice. I, I don't, we get, we usually get ribeye. I think we're only going to get hanger steak now. And it's so, we froze half of the, uh, the other half of it. It's, what's nice about that is that it's come, it's like from the same part as like a skirt steak. So it's got that same flavor. Um, it's a little bit tougher than skirt steak, but you can cook it like you. It, skirt steak is good for high high heat searing. If you do what you did to it, like you reverse sear it and you render it down, like you render out that fat and you cook it for a long time, that's it's perfect, man. It's like and I think it has better flavor than skirt steak. It's from the same part, so I like that. I like both of them. I I feel like this the flavor is similar. The texture is a little bit different. That's what I get from it. But yeah, no, good choice, man. I so I'm I'm going with beef too. I I, I got to say the past, since we last recorded, I've eaten a bunch of really delicious stuff. Since the last time we recorded was like 2 years ago. <laughs> but just just over the past couple of weeks when we had a little bit of a heat wave in New York, we fired up the the grill, the Kamado grill, and I made some marinated short ribs korean style flanking short ribs and we just put them put them on the grill seared them my son did the marinade he's like become this great chef he's your sous chef and he he, he did this this was all him in fact sous chefs this put was specials on the menu night. tom this was supposed to be steak night for for Kristen and I, and it was steak night for Kristen and I. But he bought extras and made these as appetizers for us, and we had just Korean like bulgogi, grilled in little lettuce cups with you know herbs on top, and it was it was perfect. It was perfect, and I think it was perfect because number one, my son made them. Number two, it was firing up the grill on a beautiful like eighty degree night. 
And number three, I had a cocktail in my hand while I was grilling. So, you know, they were they were good. Thank you all for tuning in on our first episode back. Uh, it's going to be a really great season. We have some incredible guests lined up. If you want to stay in touch with us, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Not A Foodie Show. My personal Twitter is Chicken Parm Poppy. My restaurant's Instagram is Mikey Pomodoro. And Tom is at Team Miale on all socials. The website is notafoodie.com. Uh, you could get us there, too, if you want uh, to pitch something to us or let us know what you think about the episode or send us hate mail, I guess. Yes, we always love hate mail. We feed off of hate mail. So, <laughs> all right, Mike. Until next time, thanks for uh, thanks for talking food. Talk to you yeah. later. Catch you guys soon. Bye. Cranberry, cranberry blue. Stick. I tried to get some baby birds down town. Tried real hard, but they couldn't be found. I went to see a swimming, he was sick in bed.